Hi everybody, FIDE Master Dennis Montecruz is here, and we're up to episode 32 in our series on the Rui Lopez. This time we're going to take a look at one of the um, the great major systems in the closed Rui, the Shigorin variation, and um, we'll look at quite a few variations within this. So first of all, let's see where this variation starts, or at least what our starting point is going to be. And it is the position from here, so the rest of the way we're going to look at variations from here. Um, we'll look at the Zeitzev next time, which generally begins with bishop to b7. And then in our last show, we'll look at the Briar, which starts with this knight going back to b8. With knight a5, we have the Chagorin. And, um, okay, we'll continue with these moves. We looked at um, the uh, Gievsky Gambit last time with d5 here. So with c5, we're now in straightforward Chagorin territory. Now, we're going to take a look at uh, both d3 and d4 options, but d3 we're going to address relatively quickly. Uh, if you want to see a little bit more about d3, I would suggest that you look up um, the show that I did on my game against uh, Pete Gargianis, or Gargianis, um, played in the U.S. Amateur Team Tournament in early 2012. Um, I'm not sure what the title of the show was, but it, it might say something like My Games from the Amateur Team Championship. Anyway, um, I had white in that game. I went on to win. But, um, but at one point he was doing, doing quite well. Uh, generally it was fine. I think at one moment I was um, slightly inaccurate and he could have obtained a, a slight edge himself. But um, failing to, to find his opportunity, then I was much better in, in one. But um, primarily the, the theoretical interest, uh, or I, I'm turning you guys to that for the theoretical discussion. Not so much for the game, although the game is interesting in its own right too. Anyway, so you'll find more about D3 there, and I've discussed D3 in a number of analogous positions uh, over the course of this series. But we'll discuss it here a little bit too. Then, once we get to D4, we're going to address uh, two major approaches by Black here. Uh, there are a number of moves that Black can play, and some of them have independent value, some are transpositional. But we have to be a bit, uh, a bit strict in terms of limiting the uh, material, or we could just do this forever. So um, I, I still think you're getting quite a lot of coverage here and what we'll look at. So we'll look at knight to d7, and then from here we'll examine with a bit of detail the moves uh, d takes c5 and knight b to d2. Sorry about that. Um, also, okay, yeah, so knight to d7, we'll look at dc and knight b to d2. There are other options, but that's all we'll cover there. And then we'll get to the main move, the, the granddaddy here, queen to c7. Knight B to D2, and now, again, a couple of plans for black. There's Knight to C6, which is a, an old plan favored by, by the, uh, the great Polish Grandmaster Akiva Rubinstein. And then there's C takes D4, which is, I would say, the absolute main line in the Chagorin. All right, so let's go back, and we'll start off with D3. Now, D3 uh, can be played for a couple of different reasons. So the, the, the plan that I chose back in the game with uh, Kari Giannis was to play for the d5 square. So I'm keeping the central structure more or less intact, and at some moment I'm going to play bishop to g5, bishop takes f6, and try to put a knight on d5. Now, of course, you have to to be very aware of everything else that's going on. You can't just unilaterally um, decide to make that plan work, but, but that's the idea, or that's one of the ideas. A second plan, or second uh, type of um, plan, is to eventually play d4, but to try to wrong foot black, to, to wait for black to commit to something such that when you finally do play d4, black will be worse off than if you had played d4 in a single move uh, at this point. So let's let's have a look at some lines. So uh, black can play a number of moves here. There's bishop to b7, there's rook e8, and there's knight to c6. And these three moves can often transpose one to another. So I'll try to show different ideas here in each of these cases. So first of all, bishop to b7. And as I've mentioned before, when white hasn't played h3, this is often especially inconvenient for black. Uh, when white's played h3, that little tempo difference can be can, can be enough to justify the development of the bishop, even when the pawn is still back on d3. And from b7, it helps support d5. And also, sometimes black can have ideas with c4, trying to undermine the e4 pawn, and with, of course, the bishop on b7 exerting some pressure, that can be quite useful. Okay, knight b to d2, 
this knight transfer to f1 and then to e3 or g3 is a, a very, very common Rui Lopez mo motif. And, of course, the moment it also helps um, support the e4 pawn. So rook e8, and this has the typical idea of bringing the bishop around to g7. Knight f1, bishop f8. And it's not just to clear the path for the bishop to, uh, to, to go to g7, but also when white plays d4, it's quite possible that black will at some point capture on d4 with his e pawn. Usually you take with the c-pawn first, but sooner or later both captures might arise, and, and once you've done that, then the rook is very well placed on the e-file. All right, so here, for instance, the uh, the plan that I chose in the uh, the game that I've mentioned before makes sense. Bishop to g5, h6, and you could take here, but we'll just follow um, the main line of theory. Bishop h4, g6, knight e3, bishop g7, queen d2. Uh, connecting the rooks and sometimes with um, ideas to, to hit the knight on a5. So knight c6, now bishop to b3, and okay, black can just chase you back and force white to, to pick a different plan, and then a4, for instance, might be chosen. So it's a typical kind of Ruy Lopez position. There's going to be quite a bit of maneuvering going on. Um, black will be on the lookout for various breaks like d5. Maybe in some cases he moves the queen moves the knight in place for f5, but here really it's difficult for him to achieve that. That does not look like an especially likely plan to arise here. For his part, white would like to put the bishop back on b3 um, soon, would love to be able to uh, exert some some influence and indeed eventual occupation over the d5 square. And there are other ideas as well. White could go for d4 at some point, maybe move the knight from f3 to h2, play rook f1 and go for f4, although it might be a little tougher to achieve that with the bishop on h4. Anyway, lots of different plans here, and, um, you know, I don't know if the theory is all that well worked out here. So a lot of standard kinds of ideas that are, are general within the Rui Lopez, but um, as far as I know, the theory is not especially deeply worked out here. Okay, so that was bishop to b7. Again, a lot of these variations can transpose one into another. All right, rook e8 this time we'll look at, waiting to see what to do with this bishop. Knight b to d2, bishop f8, knight f1, h6. So here we see another idea that's very standard and, and often a good plan, and that's to prevent the uh, bishop from going to g5 in the first place. So knight to g3. Here, there's not really any big purpose to playing knight e3. It's not that it's a bad move, but since there's not, it's not going to be anywhere near as easy for white to uh, control the d5 square, then maybe knight to g3 is going to prove better not getting in the way of the bishop on c1. All right, knight c6, and now, for instance, d4. So um, here, black is not really um, that well set up to exert some pressure against the uh, the bishop on c2 on the queen on the, uh, the the c file. We'll see that kind of idea later on in the main line of the Chagor. So this is possible too for white. All right, and then finally, from here, we'll look at knight to c6. Okay, again. Very standard. The knight's got nothing to do on a5. So the reason the knight goes to a5, let's go back to here. The knight comes to a5 just to gain a tempo for this queenside expansion. But the knight on a5 is generally pretty badly placed. It usually goes back to c6. Sometimes it goes to c4, especially if it can do so with uh, a gain of time, and then drops back to b6. All right, so d3, knight c6. <coughs> Pardon me. Knight b to d2, rook e8, knight f1. And, um, and now let's look at a couple of ideas here. If bishop to f8, then once again bishop g5 and h6. Now, white could go back to h4 here too, and then black might consider very seriously the move g5. Uh, I think we saw some variations like this way back when we were discussing the Archangelsk variation. And um, here in particular, white is not really set up for any knight takes g5 business. And if the bishop goes back to g3, it's not really a fantastic piece there. So let's go back to this position, and here I would say this is a good moment to make this exchange and to go for the d5 plan. Now, if bishop to e6, naturally you'd play bishop to b3. You're very happy to swap off the light square bishops, and again, white's dream is to end up with control over d5, to have a good knight there versus um, basically just bad, a bad black bishop on, on f8. That's kind of the, uh, the dream. All right, so g6, 
a4, and I think white has an edge. White's got a little bit of pressure on the queen side, the chance to use the d5 square, and black's uh, bishop here doesn't really carry an awful lot of uh, power here. So back here, maybe a better move, certainly a reasonable alternative at, at the very least, is h6. As mentioned, it stops the bishop to g5. So knight g3, again, no reason to go to e3 now. Well, again, that's a slight exaggeration, because sometimes knight e3, knight h2, when you put uh, a knight on g4, that can make sense, or you play queen f3, and one knight goes to g4, one knight goes to f5. So that's that's possible, although, well, yeah, so we'll, we'll just leave it at that. Um, so sometimes you can do that, but generally speaking, if there's not, if it's not likely that you're going to have control over d5, knight to g3 is often uh, a more standard development. Okay, bishop f8. Again, now d4. Takes, 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 and bishop to e6. And uh, there have been quite a few games to reach this position. It's, it's a probably, we, we might call this the, uh, the the main tabia of the d3 Chagorin. And here white has generally tried bishop to f4 and bishop to e3. Um, not with a tremendous amount of success. Uh, also, bishop to d2 can be played. So that was chosen by Vashir Lagrav against Karyakin back in 2011. And he won the game too, but uh, I believe that black can, could have equalized. And essentially, no matter what uh, white does, black plays rook to c8, the bishop moves or is defended, and then black plays d5. And it seems like it's good enough for equality. So for instance, bishop f4, rook c8, bishop e3, d5. This seems to be equal, and the results are good for black. Bishop b3, rook c8, queen d2. Okay, a little different approach, but still, d5. There we go. And finally, uh, bishop to d2 was played by Michel Legrav. Rook c8, bishop b3. And uh, I forget what Karyakin played, but again, d5. And it seems like this is sufficient for equality. So um, d3 is interesting, but perhaps uh, black can achieve equality in this way. At least when white plays d4, just swap everything off, play bishop b6, rook c8, and d5, and it uh, seems like black is doing well. So let us now turn to d4, the standard move. And here we'll address both Keras' knight to d7 and the, the classical queen c7. So let's start with this. Uh, white has tried a large number of moves here, including even king h1. I believe Kramnik used that in uh, one of his games, and in fact, it's it's been chosen quite a few times and done done um, reasonably well. But uh, I'm not going to say anything more about it. I'm just going to note that this is uh, another very interesting try. I, I Kramnik might have even been the guy who originated it, but uh, I won't say anything more about it. Um, okay, so there's that. There's a4. This is another interesting try. Uh, d5 is another possibility. Generally, white is not in a hurry to play d5, except when black has played bishop to b7. So in, in Chagorin variations where black plays that, then d5 is, is pretty normal, as uh, black will have to spend a second tempo, or at least probably should spend a second tempo, bringing it back to c8, um, where it's going to be on an open diagonal. Well, it's nice black can try for f5, the bishop on b7. Anyway, um, so after d5, knight to b6, knight b to d2, and here black can choose uh, kind of analogously to a Sveshnikov Sicilian. It's either play f5 right away and recapture with pieces, or to play g6 first and have the option of recapturing with a pawn on f5, should white capture there. Okay, so those are very important and interesting sidelines, but we're only going to talk about d takes c5 and knight b to d2. So d takes c5, d takes c5, and, uh, and I should say, this was uh, Fisher's initial reaction to this in, in Curaçao in 62 and the candidates when Karas played this. Uh, interestingly, in the first game he played that dc dc line and, and beat Karas in a beautiful game. The next time they played when Fisher had white, later in the same event, Fisher played knight b to d2, didn't really get anything, and uh, lost a long and tough fight doesn't mean that DC is the best move, but it's uh, it was kind of an interesting psychological um, uh, you know problem that that Fisher uh, dealt with. You know, I guess a bit of game theory 
So uh, should you stick with what was successful, especially if you don't see any problem with it, or should you um, just assume that if your opponent's willing to go for it, that he's got some great idea planned for the next time around? Anyhow, uh, I think Fisher should have gone for, for DC a second time. But be that as it may, they're both uh, important options. So let's start with DC. So DC, DC. And I should say that Fisher liked this kind of structure in general, this uh, so-called rouser structure. So the, the great Soviet theoretician uh, is the one who popularized this kind of uh, structure, not necessarily against knight to d7, but in the Chagorin in general. And it's easy to see why at, at first, because you're, you're keeping the, uh, the d5 square open. So you've got a pawn on c3, and black, therefore, cannot, at least not in the usual case, safely put a, a piece on d4. But with white, you can put a piece on d5. So that that um, offers at least some potential advantage. So the knight goes swinging around to b2, uh, to d2, to f1, to e3, and then to d5. And even if black captures on d5 and you have to take with a pawn, that opens the uh, the diagonal for the bishop on c2, which can be uh, quite powerful. All right, well, let's uh, look at some, some lines here. So knight b to d2, and now... Uh, two variations for black that we'll discuss, f6 and bishop to b7. Now, f6, I think, is uh, a bit shaky. Now, the idea is, is logical. So he wants to, he's just protecting the e5 pawn, and that frees up the knight to go to b6, and, um, and black continues with his queenside play. The drawback of this, and in fact of this whole carrier system in general, is that it's abandoning the king side. So white is, you know, slowly but surely shuffling his pieces, in the uh, in the direction of the black king, while black is carrying everyone over to the other side of the board, and uh, sometimes obviously white is going to uh, to crash through. So knight h4 here, uh, knight f1 is also common and it's very good, it scored very well for white. But knight h4 seems like the most principled move here, planning knight f5 and queen g4. And in fact, I think if white achieves knight to f5, he's better. So my view is that black's best move here is g6. And now white's got several reasonable options. You can play queen to g4, you can play knight to b3, you can play knight f1. And uh, I think that white is doing okay in all of these cases, um, but whether he's got uh, a certain advantage, you know, something that's tangible, I'm not 100% sure. So let's um, go back here. So f6 is at best a bit shaky, though. So, like I said, f6 followed by g6 may um, prevent white from having anything certain, but still black is, you know, uh, living a little bit dangerously. So bishop to b7, I think, is is perhaps a, a better plan. And, uh, well, for one thing, it keeps white's knight off of h4, and it makes white's kingside buildup take a bit longer. All right, so from here, white has tried various moves. Queen e2, um, just getting the queen off of the d-file, both to put uh, a rook there, but also to avoid any variations where a queen trade might occur. b3 is another idea to prevent the knight c4, b6 idea. Uh, so finally, though, there's knight to f1. And now black plays knight c4. So this stops knight to e3, or at least it makes white have to play something like b3 first. But see, if you play b3 with white, then black can play later on, of course, after moving the knight, can play b4, and then white's d4 square is just as weak as black's d5 square. So that's uh, the idea there. So, uh, sorry, after knight c4, white could play knight to g3, just getting on with the, uh, the knight transfer. Could play b3, could play queen to e2. And after queen e2, black sometimes plays queen c7, sometimes plays rook e8. Lots of theory there. But um, all I want to look at here is knight 3 to h2. And this is not the main move, but it's, it's a reasonable try. Shirov played it a few years ago and, um, and won a nice game against uh, Mortis Kashgalev. And, um, and this, we'll have a look at this just to see what kinds of, you know, what this white attack looks like in practice. So we'll see a typical white pile up over on the king side. And, um, you know, this is the kind of thing that black has to be careful about. Now, in the game, or the, the, the fragment of the game we're going to look at, um, it seems that what black needed to do at some point was to, to push a kingside pawn or other, maybe f6, maybe h6, I think at different moments, um, you know, uh, one move or the other one, not necessarily both at the same time, but one or the other move would have been um, uh, enough of a rejoinder, or would have been a sufficient rejoinder to maintain at least a near balance. 
Anyway, um, the game went like this. Queen c7, knight g4, rook f to e8, queen f3, bishop f8, knight g3. Okay, the knight wants to go to f5, so Kajgaliev played knight to d6. Now, Shiroff flings another piece over at the king side, bishop to g5. And, okay, black is, um, you know, it doesn't have any real weaknesses, but clearly black's play is purely reactive. He doesn't really have much by way of target either. So he decides, okay, I'll play c4, and then knight c5, and hope to uh, pressure e4, and, and maybe dump a piece on d3 at some point as well. But after knight e3, and then knight c5, uh, now it's certain that white stands better. And after this exchange, now that bishop on c2 is in the act as well. And with so many active pieces, black is uh, starting to get into trouble. So he played e4 to, uh, to close down that diagonal, but now the pawn's weak. So queen to g3, king h8 getting off the uh, g file, but knight f6 anyway. And of course he can't take because after bishop f6, bishop g7, queen takes g7 as mate. So he plays rook e7, now bishop f4 hitting the uh, pin knight. Rook to d8, and now he just cashes it. Knight takes e4, knight e4, bishop e4. And um, if black plays, uh, well, if black ends up taking on e4, white takes on c7 and on d8, so black can't do it. So white's got an extra pawn here, good bishops, and uh, went on to win the endgame. All right, so that was um, this knight 3 to h2 idea. Again, it's not the main move, but it's just, it was just for illustrative purposes. So let's go back a little bit more to here. And now instead of um, knight b to d2, well, dc, dc, and knight b to d2, let's have a look at knight b to d2. And this leads to a very popular variation, the, uh, the Graf variation, named after the, uh, I believe he's a German grandmaster now, um, Alexander Graf, formerly Alexander Nenashev, or Nenashev. So e takes d4, cd, knight c6. Um, here, white usually plays d5, that's what we'll look at, but I'll mention that uh, Anish Giri played knight to f1 against Nakamura in 2011 and, and won the game, so it's clearly got a, a little drop of poison. So d5, knight c to e5. Uh, here, white sometimes plays a4, but knight e5 as usual. Okay, and now a4. Uh, f4 is also possible, but okay, a4 is the main move. Here, bishop to b7 is possible, but rook b8 is the main move. a, b, a, b, f4 knight g6, knight f3. And, okay, it's move 19, but we're still very, very much within theory here. And it's it's really a fascinating line. Black's got a queenside majority, and, uh, you know, white's got the central majority. So in, in a way, there there's some, some kinships to the modern Benoni here. White is going to go for, can go for e5, but often he plays for f5, um, giving up the e5 square, but if the knight goes to e5, black or white can just trade there. And then black can't use the dark squares. The d5 pawn is passed. So white is going to build up most of the time for kingside play. Black will try to neutralize it, and we'll see one of the uh, standard means that he uses to do that in a moment, and hopes that uh, his queenside majority can become useful at some point. Also, he may play bishop to f6, and in some cases trying to uh, use this bishop on the, the strong diagonal. Anyway, let's, let's, let's have a look. All right, so one line will... Mention it's not not as common, but it's it's interesting. Is to play f5, trying to uh, neutralize White's central pawn mass right away. The drawback of this is that it, it's going to entail either uh, allowing the pawns to start rumbling again or an exchange sacrifice. So takes takes takes, and now White can play rook a7 or queen d3, but the main and most principled move is g4, and he's just going to keep going forward. Uh, if the rook goes back, you go f5. But black plays this with the idea of this exchange sacrifice. And here, I don't know if it's 100% compensation, but it's not bad. Uh, the knight's good there. The, uh, the center is no longer clogged up by white pawns. So if black plays bishop f6, there's no danger of e4, e5 coming to, uh, to neutralize it. Uh, the d5 pawn, the h3 pawn are both a little bit loose. The b2 pawn's a little bit loose. So black's got, got some chances here. White may be a little bit better with the extra material, but not much. Nevertheless, the main move here is bishop to h4. And, uh, you know, so this is an attempt to keep the bishop active and sometimes plug up the uh, the king side a bit, but um, 
but keeping it active without having it choke to death on white's uh, central mass. All right, black uh, or white sometimes. Well, let me try that again. White's got two main moves here: it either takes the bishop or moves the rook, and uh, it doesn't ever move the rook to e2, but rather plays rook f1. Well, let's start with just this capture. So white grabs the bishops with gain of time, or at least not without losing time, and now plays f5. And this looks kind of strange. You might think, well, shouldn't we just play e5 or something? But um, it's not, not so easy. I mean, first of all, the f4 pawn is hanging. And if you play rook f1, then there's bishop takes h3. And if you take, then black's got an immediate draw. So that's not really a very good result for white. So f5, knight e5, and rook f1. So white wants to play f6. And the knight looks nice on e5, but if it doesn't really do very much there, then white's happy. Okay, bishop to d7, bishop f4, rook a8. Um, yeah, black's got two two things to, to consider here. So if, if um, well, white played bishop to f4 to take on e5, and then to have a passed uh, d pawn. So black could play queen to e7 here to stop that. The drawback is that white plays rook a7, and... Um, Okay, maybe white has some, some edge here. Certainly white's got the initiative at this point, and black is trying to neutralize white's ideas. Uh, the point of rook f to d8, by the way, is that before that, white is looking at bishop takes e5 anyway, because again, d, e, and you get the passed pawn. Queen e5 hangs the bishop. So that takes care of that. All right, the other big move is rook to a8, probably the bigger move. And now white swaps, plays queen d2. Okay, let's say c4. King h2, and white may have a, a small edge at this point. Nothing huge, but clearly it's it's white who's got the better chances, if anybody does. So back to here. The alternative to knight h4 is to play rook f1. So now bishop g3. So that's that's how you, you activate this guy. Okay, f5, knight e5. And now white's tried a few moves, but I think knight to g5 is, is the, uh, the best. No messing around here. White is going for the kill. And now I believe the main, or the, the, the only move, in fact, uh, is h6. So knight to d7 was the main line, but and, and it still sometimes played, but I think there's uh, an email game that was played, let me see, I think it was back in 2007. Yeah, in 2007. Uh, not with players with huge ratings, but that's the thing. you got to be careful in the databases. Sometimes you might see uh, a game with uh, relatively low ratings. But if it's an email game, if it's a correspondence game, then, you know, it may still be a very important game. So do check that before you just say, ah, these guys are experts, you know, they're, they're okay players, but I'm going to look at the professionals. Well, if it's a recent game and it's a correspondence game of some sort, it might be fantastic because, of course, these guys are using their engines and, uh, you know, are often quite, quite adept at doing so. Okay, so let's take a look at this uh, email game here. Knight to d7. Knight takes h7. So this is very strong. King h7, f6. Uh, and I think there was some game here, a higher level game, where black just gave back the piece very quickly, but again lost. So uh, yeah, this is uh, all about preparation here if you're white. So g6, and now queen g4. So this, this uh, excellent move, I think, is just winning. So bishop to e5, queen h4 check, king g8. Okay, and now we'll look at the game first. So in the game, white played bishop to g5, protecting the, the f pawn, so we can play queen h6 at some point. And in the game, black played b4, and this meant with a, a painful refutation, bishop a4. So white wants to, to take this knight and then play queen h6. So black was uh, obligated to play knight f6 while he still could. Okay, we had a little repeating going on, and then finally white played king h1. It's, it's kind of funny, but it's true that in correspondence chess, just like regular chess, just like over-the-board chess, uh, players will, will do little tricks to gain time on the, uh, well, on the calendar, not the clock. Because uh, they have time limits, too, and if you're busy and you're playing a lot of games, or, you know, and you, you want to have your, uh, your computers running longer, <laughs> it uh, sometimes behooves you to, uh, to, to do things like that. It's not just the computers running. I mean, of course, uh, players have to interact and drive the computer, but you understand the point I'm making. So uh, White does spring into action, though. He's not after a draw. He is better. And, in fact, the game ends pretty quickly here. So White just builds up. 
Uh, here, if rook takes a1, then bishop to e6 is, is crushing. So queen takes d7, rook a to f1, and now rook 1 to f4. And, uh, you know, there are ideas like rook h4 and queen h6, maybe in some cases rook g4 and rook takes g6. So here, uh, black resigned. This was the game Bos Boschma, or Boschma against Ward, uh, ICCF email in 2007. Well, let's go back to here. So the question I, I had, well, if b4, bishop to a4, why is black playing b4? Okay, so why not c4, for instance? All right, so here's uh, some, some of my own analysis. Rook f3, c3, and this is, in fact, a very good move. It makes white's life kind of difficult. So bc, b4, rook a to f1, bishop a6. So it took me quite a while to really bust this, but I, I'm sure Boschmud worked all of this out back in 2007, and um, and hopefully I succeeded in finding the uh, the relevant approaches for white nowadays. So queen h6, knight takes f6, and now the calm rook 1 to f2. So this knight is not running away. b3, bishop b1, no big deal. All right, now uh, we'll look at a couple of possibilities. So uh, if bishop to d3, just bishop takes d3, rook a8, queen h4, and the knight's going to collapse, and uh, black's queenside counterplay is obviously too slow. So that's that's all pretty obvious. The only reason why I even bothered to mention bishop to d3 is that it was the engine's first choice. So bishop to c4 is a much more human response, preparing rook a8 and rook a1, and not just uh, donating pieces for no reason. Well, let's see what happens. Bishop f6, bishop f6, rook f6. So white's up a pawn. Let's try to make some counterplay for black though. b2, and now rook 2 to f4. And with rook h4 coming right up, uh, black is busted. The only try, I suppose, is queen f6, and then rook a8, hoping for counterplay. But uh, white's attack still comes crashing in. e5, rook a1, rook g6, takes, and mate on h7. So uh, I think black is in big, big trouble in this variation with knight to d7 from back here. So I think black really has to play h6 if he wants to stay alive. So now it's it's still very precarious for him. f6, and here if he takes, then bishop g5, threatening fg7, g6, and now rook a3, and lo and behold, the bishop is stuck. And um, obviously, if, if white is attacking for free, and, and it has that pawn on f6 there, as a permanent possession, then black is just dead lost, and, and he is. So hg is no good. Another try is g takes f6, but after knight f3, white has more than enough compensation for the pawn. And then finally, there's g6. So this is a very logical move, preventing queen h5. Okay, um, rook a3 is interesting. This was tried by the uh, Greek grandmaster and very good theoretician, Catronius, back in 2008, and he won, but Admittedly, it was against a player 300 points lower rated than him, so he probably would have beaten him in any case. All right, so uh, bishop to a4, knight f3, or h4, knight f3, bishop f6, bishop h6, and that's how the game went, and it's just an interesting position here. I suspect, at least superficially, that knight f3 is um, the best try. And now, for instance, queen takes f6, bishop takes h6, Rook e8, knight takes, queen takes, and rook a3 again, preparing to swing the rook over to the king side. And I think white stands better here. So my um, my feeling about this uh, Groff variation where black plays ed and then starts, uh, well, and gets to this kind of position here, uh, I think white has an edge there. So that's at least my, my opinion at the moment, but it's uh, it's a very interesting and sharp line. All right, so now let's get to the uh, the granddaddy here, queen c7. Okay, and again, white's got lots of options here, but we'll stick to, to uh, just knight b to d2. But he can play d5 and uh, a host of other moves. Um, yeah, well, d5 is the other main alternative, but it's it's way back in popularity. But, you know, I should at least note that this exists. All right, but again, white generally plays d5 only when black has played bishop to b7, or at least it's... That's the time to do it. It's it's okay here, but um, especially when black has played bishop to b7, then it's uh, it's much more promising. 
Okay, so knight b to d2. And now, for instance, um, let's take a look at knight c6. So this marks the start of an exceedingly um, passive but playable plan. Um, Marin, the, uh, the, the excellent author and, and Romanian grandmaster, um, actually advocated this in his, um, his book, what was it called? Uh, something like an a re opening repertoire with the Spanish, or a Spanish opening repertoire. It was with Gambit, uh, or sorry, not Gambit, with Quality Chess back around 2008 or 2009. And um, I was, I, I like his books a lot, but this seemed to me a really strange choice because it's, first of all, it's, it's a variation where black draws somewhat regularly, but almost never wins. I mean, it's, it's really unpromising as a winning try. And again, black has to just make so many defensive moves there. So I'll just give you a quick overview of what usually happens. Uh, d5, knight to d8, great square for the knight, right? Uh, a4, rook b8, so now white gets the, the a file as well. And now um, white sometimes plays a, b, sometimes b4, um, well, a, b, and then b4 were b4 right away. So the question is, who benefits most from opening the, um, the a file? White, of course, looks like he's better, better uh, situated at the moment, but as we'll see, black can sometimes contest it, and then maybe white will wish that he uh, hadn't committed just yet. All right, so if a, b, a, b, b4, c4, knight f1, so the queen side's nice and fixed here, knight e8, knight 3 to h2, f6, f4. So white's got more space everywhere. Black is just in this little huddle here. Um, sometimes kind of amusingly, at least it's visually amusing, uh, black will play g6, Knight f7 and knight to g7. And, uh, you know, in, in theory, it might look like he can make some kind of King's Indian style build up and, and, and start pushing white back, but white generally has so much space over there that that really doesn't become feasible. Anyway, let's continue here. Knight f7, knight f3, g6, f5, knight g7, and now g4. So that illustrates all of the points that I just made. Uh, black is. I don't know, Fien kettled the one knight, you know, neither knight looks good, neither of black's bishops looks good, his queen doesn't look good, his rooks don't look good, but it's very solid. So as I said, this line leads to uh, a relatively high percentage of draws, uh, but black winning, you know, that's that's pretty tough. So bishop d7, bishop e3, and rook a8. So um, some of you may be familiar with this, this great old game, Karpov Unzicker, I think it was from the uh, Olympiad in Nice back in 1974, where Karpov famously put his bishop on a7, doubled the rooks behind it, and really kept black seriously bottled up to the end of the game. And um, something like that occurred in, in game two of the second Deep Blue Kasparov match as well, the game with the, uh, the, the famous alleged perpetual check at the end. A anyway... So that plan is, is a very dangerous one, but here, because the, the, the file was open right away, black was able to contest it before white could put a plan like that into, into action. So, okay, white would play queen at e2 and begin some kind of long siege, but at least because black has contested the a-file successfully, it looks like it might have been more accurate for white to delay the exchange on b5. So let's go back here and, and do that. So b4, c4, knight f1, knight e8, and from here, white has uh, a couple of main plans to, uh, to choose between. So one plan is to play something like knight 3 to h2 followed by f4, and at some point swap on b5. A second plan, which um, may be the original plan in this, in this variation, is for white to play this, uh, this big knight post up. So he plays, uh, brings the pawn to g4, puts the knight on g3, play king h2, rook g1, and dump the knight on f5. And black really can't afford to take. And if he does take, well, uh, taking with the pawn on g6. If he does, you usually take back with the e pawn, not with the g pawn, but the e pawn. So you get this big mass. So the bishop on c2 can play a part in the attack. e4 comes under your control, and you can use that as a, as a transfer point for, for your pieces. And the f and g pawns uh, start rolling down the board further. So that's uh, a second plan. Both are very dangerous for black to, uh, to deal with. And again, I, I would recommend not playing this line um, 
for black at all. It's again, it's not that it loses, but it's uh, it just promises suffering and uh, not a lot of wins. Whoops. Okay, so let's go back to here and instead look at the main line with c takes d4. So cd, knight c6, and there are options for black besides this, but again, this is the uh, the main the main route. So knight to b3. Uh, defending the d-pawn and clearing the way for the bishop from c1 to come into the game. So a5 prepares to kick the knight back, get the bishop out first, a4, knight b to d2. And now uh, we'll focus on bishop to d7, but I'll mention two other moves. If knight to b4 which looks aggressive, it's it's really one of these forward retreat things. White plays bishop to, b2, bishop to b1, but next he'll play a3, and then bishop to d3. So in fact, black is losing a tempo because uh, his knight's going to go back to c6 where it started from, but white's bishop is going to go to d3, which is much more useful than c2. It puts pressure on the, uh, the b5 pawn. So knight to b4 really is not to be recommended. All right, second move is bishop to e6. Of course, white's not winning a piece with d5 because of knight to b4, but after a3, it is a threat. All right, black can play the, the cute rook f to c8, and now if d5, the knight just moves away, and again the bishop is threatened. Well, white plays rook c1, and now um, d5 is not only a fourth threat, but there might be some cases, although not yet, but some positions coming up where the rook on c1 could attack the queen, and the bishop on c2 can move with, with tempo. But it's not yet, because after bishop to d7, if white were to play uh, d5 and the bishop takes a4 here, black would just trade twice on c1, and then play b takes a4. So the right move here is bishop to d3. Okay, let's say queen to b8, queen e2, b4, and now rook c4. And I think white has an edge. Uh, white's tried other moves here too, like knight c4, and that's not bad either. But I think rook c4 is best. Uh, this occurred in some game where uh, Mecking had black, and he went on to win, but at this point, uh, I believe he's worse. So um, d5, takes, takes, takes here. Yeah, and I believe Mecking's opponent, another very strong grandmaster, I forget who it is offhand though, uh, played knight to g5, and that's okay as well, but I think bishop to c5 is best, and it doesn't seem to me that black's compensation is anywhere near sufficient for the pawn. I, I think white's clearly better here. So, back to here, instead of bishop b6, which ends up losing a tempo, right? We saw bishop goes back to d7 or knight to b4, which loses a tempo a different way because white's bishop will end up on d3. Black should just play the restrained bishop to d7, and um, and then after rook c1, now a3 is possible too, but rook c1, queen b7. Um, this is a position that's okay. Uh, although I think white white has very good chances for an edge here. All right, uh, for instance, okay, bishop to b1. This was played in a Topala Vivanchuk game from uh, Monte Carlo in 2011, rapid game, and um, white got an edge and won that game. So it went h6, knight f1, rook f to e8, d5, knight a5, b3. Now here though I think um, rook e to c8 might be an improvement over what was played by, by Ivanchuk. So um, the point of this is to, to, to let black be better equipped when or if and when white plays a, a subsequent b4. So you'll see what I mean in a moment. So uh, Ivanchuk played bishop to d8 with a very reasonable idea. He wants to play bishop to b6 and activate this bad bishop or trade it off. But the problem here is that now bishop to d3, um, bishop to b6, white plays b4. And black's rook is not on c, c4 in time here, or c8 in time. So knight c4 takes, takes uh, a3, um, yeah, if he plays, yeah, if he plays rook c4, then bishop to b5, and then take on f1, take on e3, and then take on b4. So a3 covers that, rook a to c8, bishop b6, and rook c3. And um, this good blockading rook here really um, makes white's life easy, and he stands better. Well, not only does the rook on c3 blockade, and uh, give him the option of putting pressure against the c4 pawn, but white may also move the knight from f3, and then rook can transfer over to g3 with uh, with some attacking chances. So I think the immediate rookie to c8 was maybe better 
trying to be prepared for any uh, better prepared for a knight to c4 move. And also back here, instead of bishop to d6 right away, I think a b first is better, and then bishop to b6. So now um, if you have the same kind of variation, right? So if you look at this position here, if you get rid of the a pawns, well, there's no a3 for white, plus black's rook has an open file. So I think with those two improvements, black should be okay. All right, so that was bishop to b1. Uh, the second most popular move here is knight to f1, and it's also worthy of attention, but I won't give it any here, um, except to let you know that it exists. The most popular move is queen e2, and this is what we'll focus on. Now, we'll look at rook f to uh, e8, but rook f to c8, while less popular, is certainly very logical as well. After all, it is uh, an open file. So, you know, black has to choose. You know, where is he going to put his his, uh, his rooks? In the main line, it's rook f to e8. Okay, bishop to d3, and now rook a to b8. All right, uh, here white plays d takes e5, and now both recaptures are, are very possible for black, and they're both pretty common. Knight takes e5 is the preference of the top guys, so we'll start with d takes e5 instead. Now, a very uh, pleasant idea for white is bishop to c5. So white would love to, to make this exchange because then his rook can go to c5 where it puts pressure against b5, against e5, and allows for white to double or maybe in some positions even triple on the c file and uh, exert pressure that way. But on bishop to c5 there is one drawback and it's the black and play knight h5, and now all of a sudden the possibility of knight to f4 looks really uh, rather distasteful from white's perspective. And he can't play g3 because the h3 pawn would hang. So black seems to be doing fine here. This looks like it's equal. So a3, h6, and again, you know, what do you do with this waiting game? Well, it looks like white still has nothing better than bishop to c5. But, all right, if you're knight h5, takes, knight f4, queen e3, rook e7, Rook c5, queen to a6. Yeah, uh, not knight takes d3. Knight takes d3, I think, is a, a rather poor move. After queen takes d3, yes, uh, black has the small advantage of the one bishop, but the advantage of the two bishops is a much more uh, meaningful advantage than the, the advantage of the one bishop, at least in many situations. And here, with white's pieces being much more active than black's, uh, and, and black having multiple pawn targets, uh, I think this would be a mistake. And indeed, white has gone 3-0 and from here, including uh, games with at least one game with, with uh, very strong grandmasters. So instead of taking on d3 and trading off this, this beautiful knight, uh, black should play, I think, queen to a6. And here, white has tried several moves. Uh, rookie to c1. Uh, he's tried bishop to f1 to preserve the bishop. And in general, it's just a good idea to, to, lim to remove your pieces from squares where they're attacked. And then a third idea was uh, knight to b1 with the idea of playing knight c3. They're all they're all reasonable. Uh, certainly white isn't worse, but but white's success hasn't been all that fantastic. So black has done pretty well here as well. Nevertheless, the main move is, or at least the main move against uh, uh, among top players, is knight takes e5. So knight e5, d e, and uh, and now we've got another parting of the ways here. Two, two options for white that we'll consider. Knight to f3, putting the knight on a, a better track, and um, bishop to c5. All right, let's start with knight f3. On this, bishop to b4. Rookie to d1, bishop c6. So here, black is uh, putting some pressure on the e4 pawn, but white has little tricks here. Bishop c5, takes, takes. And um, if bishop b4, then of course the b pawn and the e pawn are both uh, imperiled. So what black does here is he plays knight to d7, kicks the rook away, rook c3, and then the knight goes back. Uh, otherwise, white will be able to, to uh, take care of the e4 pawn at his leisure while subsequently going after black's uh, b and e pawns. Now this, of course, is uh, only good for black if you're willing to draw, because white can play rook c5 and repeat. But Generally, white declines this option. I think I only saw one game where white uh, went for the repetition. So rook e1 as usual, b4, rook c5, knight e7, rook c4, knight f6. And now white has done well with both um, queen e3 and a3, fixing the a4 pawn in place 
and hoping to use the B four square with the rook. So uh, this I think may be uh, a very good option for white with knight f three. But bishop to c five certainly isn't bad either. Um, so let me think. Yeah, I think I should make knight f three the main line. All right, but bishop c five, as I said, is also quite decent. Uh, bishop c six, knight f three. And here, if black plays bishop takes c5, then after rook c5, we've transposed to the knight f3 line, but done so in a more direct way. Okay, so knight to d7 instead. Takes, takes, rook, e, uh, rook c3. Knight f8, hoping to swing the knight around to uh, d4 or f4. Rook e to c1. Bishop e8. And now white has tried both b3 and b4, and uh, has enjoyed, again, a little bit more comfortable a slightly more comfortable position um, than black. So it's it's uh, clearly black who's got to do the neutralizing. He's got to keep his, his queenside pawns and the e5 pawn safe. Uh, the e5 pawn is not going to be too too big a deal at this point. And of course white has the, uh, the c file under control for the moment too. All right, so that will do it for my discussion of the, uh, the Chagorin. Hopefully you guys have a, a much better sense of what's possible here than you did before you watch this. And, um, you know, again, it wasn't uh, encyclopedic coverage. I mean, it's a very, very rich system. Books could be written about it. But nevertheless, I hope that this at least has given you some sense of, of the key ideas and a feeling for the, the general lay of the land. So, um, again, this was for many years the, uh, the ultimate main line of the Rui. It's been superseded, I think, nowadays by the Briar, which is why we'll finish with that. And, uh, and the Zaitsev is also a, another very, uh, is an extremely interesting variation that we'll look at more carefully next time. So, hope you guys enjoyed it. I'll see you then. Take care. Bye-bye.